You know, it's really hard once you do enough of these videos to find the best way to introduce them. And every time I try and introduce one, I keep saying to myself, Matt, you say that every time you start a video. So I'm going to try my best to say something new every time now. Hello, everyone. It's me, Matt. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to be original here and have some fun because I'm extremely fed up with this whole coronavirus craziness that's going on recently. So I thought I'd make another video to try and bring you guys that are stuck indoors and doing whatever else you have to do to support your friends, family at this difficult time. Have a video for you to watch. Hopefully you can get some enjoyment out of it and sit back and relax a little bit and learn a little bit about some trapped fighting vehicles today. And in particular, we're talking about the K-21 infantry fighting vehicle from South Korea. Now, you know my passion for infantry fighting vehicles. I do really enjoy them. Of course, if you're used to my channel, you will know of my favorite infantry fighting vehicles, which are the CV-9040 and the Warrior Infantry Fighting Vehicle, of which I did serve with in the British Army uh, as a tank mechanic uh, alongside armored infantry, and I absolutely love the vehicle, especially now it's getting upgrades. But as I said, we are talking about the K-21 and its South Korean variant of the IFV. So the K-21 was developed as a replacement for the K-200 series from the 1980s, which was deemed a bit too light for the 21st century battlefields and, of course, by the end of the 1990s, its age was starting to show. The development of its successor, back then referred to as the K-300 or NIFV, Next Infantry Fighting Vehicle, was launched by Dusan Defense Systems and Technology, a military equipment branch of the massive Dusan conglomerate. In 1999, this is what was happening, and in the first prototypes were being built around about 2003-2005. The idea behind it was similar to that of most modern IFVs. Instead of relying upon mobility alone, the military wanted something far better protected that could not only hold its own weight in firefights, but also turn against the Russian IFVs such as the BMP-3 into a scrap. Now, South Korea was of course very familiar with what the Russians could build. Ironically, three years prior to the launch of the development of the K-300, it had received several dozen BMP-3 IFVs from Russia as payment for a previously incurred debt, along with some TATU main battle tanks. Now, these are normally only associated with a very few amount of countries outside of Russia, but South Korea got its hands on them nevertheless. The Russian vehicles were subsequently very carefully studied by both Korean and American engineers, but that's a story for another time. Suffice to say that the capabilities of these machines were impetuous to Korean armor development, along with the threat of North Korea as well as the emergence of China as military superpowers. As is their nature, the Koreans were quite fast to develop a rather modern IFV that would protect its crew against Russian 30mm autocannons. The first three prototypes were tested between 2003 and 2005 and were subsequently accepted into service under the name K-21. The K-21 IFVs weighs around 25 tons, which is substantially lower than some of the heavy IFVs out there today. It has a crew of three men, commander, gunner and driver, and can carry up to nine troops with full equipment. Its armor is made of military grade aluminum or aluminium, along with some fiberglass and ceramic composite elements. Its advanced layout requires a frontal protection against Russian 30mm 2A72 autocannon shells, including armor piercing, although side protection of the vehicle is a lot lower and can withstand only 14.5mm armor piercing bullets, which is still quite substantial as an improvement over the small arms and all round protection of the K200. The vehicle flanks can also withstand fragments of nearby 10m or further 152mm shell explosions, which is pretty common artillery explosions that would be lent against these vehicles if they went against North Korea. Additional protective systems include advanced MBC protection system, automatic fire extinguisher, laser warning system, which was added at some point during the production to these vehicles, but not all have it. The vehicle carries a turret that's armed with a Korean-developed K40 40mm automatic rifle cannon derived from the Swedish XK40 Bofors, capable of firing 300 rounds per minute. It can fire several rounds including the K219 armored piercing tracer, the K237 armored piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo tracer, capable of penetrating up to around 220mm of rolled homogeneous armor with 1380m a second velocity. There is also the K216 high explosive tracer round, and finally the K236 programmable high explosive, which can be set to impact delayed fuse or even air burst mode. The ammunition is stored in a carousel below the gun. The gun itself can elevate to around plus 45 degrees and depress to minus 7 degrees. 
It is fully stabilised and also controlled by a truly advanced fire control system. In addition to that, the crew has several high-tech tools at its disposal, including a battlefield management system and other electronic targeting systems, which are actually classified and not being shown, and I can't seem to find any information on this fancy fire control system, but from what it's been told and from what I can find, it has some very, very good optronics and optics inside there. And last but not least, there is the matter of mobility, which is really the key to this vehicle. The K21 is powered by a 10-cylinder, 740 horsepower Doosan D2840LXE diesel engine, and some sources do state that it is only 680 horsepower. However, that much power pushed behind a 25-ton vehicle, it's pretty powerful. Its maximum speed is around 70 kilometers an hour, and it is worth noting that the vehicle is amphibious, but this feature requires the deployment of built-in flotation bags and baffles, which is fortunately for the crew, automatic as well, and very fast. With these deploys, the maximum swimming speed is approximately 7 km an hour, which, if you're working in Korea with lots of streams and rivers around you, you're going to have something that doesn't have to require the use of bridges all the time. This is a key attribute and something that they've definitely pushed upon this design of the vehicle, similar to that of the BMP style vehicle, and you can see the kind of similarities between this and the BMP3. It's almost like it's been cross-compared with a Bradley and a Warrior and a BMP3. It's like they've all just had a hybrid of DNA and turned into this kind of odd looking IFV and to me it does look kind of odd because I can't quite tell what it is when you first look at it. You want it to be a Bradley, you want it to be a Warrior and you want it to be a BMP3. A PIP version or product improvement program was currently developed last year with a number of upgrades envisioned. The ERA kit or explosive reactive armor kit was given for additional anti-personnel and anti-missile protection with a steel arid net armor placed upon it. The KAPS hard kill active protection system the Raybolt missile launcher for additional anti-tank capability, similar to that of the Bradley with its own 2-2 missile launcher on the side, and an up to engine to 840 horsepower, which for a small IFV is insane. The Raybolt missiles feature tandem heat warheads and are launched upwards, descending upon the target from high angles in order to hit vulnerable roof armor, similar to that of the modern day Javelin missile that we see out there today. Their flight velocity is 580 meters a second, and their range is about 2.5 kilometers to 3 kilometers, which is more than enough when fighting in these hilly, jungly terrains. According to some sources, they are capable of self-homing, which is a fire and forget mode, and can penetrate up to 900 millimeters or more of armor after defeating explosive reactive armor. That's quite substantial when you're talking about knocking out a tank. Another potential upgrade unveiled to the public was to be the installation of the 40mm CTA automatic cannon to the vehicle, similar to that that's been placed upon the Warrior Infantry Fighting Vehicle today. However, apart from several renders, no other information I can find is available. Mass production of this vehicle was launched in November 2009, and due to a large volume contract, the price was very competitive. By 2015, the cost per was apparently half that of the Bradley fighting vehicle, and 85% of its components were domestic origin. A remarkable feat for South Korea. According to some sources, the production nearly ended in 2016, but it's currently unclear how many were built in total. The most common estimate that I can find is around about 400 vehicles of the 900 originally intended to serve alongside more than 1,000 remaining upgraded K200 IFVs. One final interesting thing about this vehicle is its producer. Doosan DST was renamed in 2016 to Hanwha Defense Systems along with its partner company Hanwha Land Systems, responsible for some elements of the K2 Black Panther as well as the K9 Thunder SPG, both belonging under another company, Hanwha Techwin. This is why different sources state different names. Interestingly enough, the vehicle has performed very well in the environments that it's been placed in. Hilly, mountainous terrains with up and down hills, lots of power required from that power pack, it does very well for itself. The fact that it is able to engage tanks is critical for an IFE in a South Korean environment. They will have to eventually, if it came to it, be placed against other tanks, and its capability with the 40mm at least allows it to engage just about every infantry fighting vehicle that North Korea would place against it. Its mobility really is key though. The fact that this thing can drive so powerfully quick and cross rivers really gives it a game changer across the battle group for South Korean forces. Also, nine troops being carried in the back is quite a lot of troops and equipment to be pushing into the front line when engaging large swarms of infantry that could be pushing against you. 
This vehicle I could safely say is competitive in the modern day battlefield as an infantry fighting vehicle, but it's safe to say that its armour penetration against that side plate is not of the highest standard and could be upgraded to be a little bit more capable of being resistant to North Korean heavy armaments. So, there you have it folks, the South Korean K21 IFV. I have to admit, it does look rather sleek. I do really enjoy the fact that it can push 9 troops out the back and have that 40mm autocannon in front of it. Uh, and the uh, anti-tank missile is also a nice added benefit, especially with the top-down attack. The hunter-kill mode with the uh, top-down uh, attack missiles and the hunter-killer sighting system with the 40mm really does give it a bit of a, uh, you know, all-round tank destroyer kind of feel uh, but it's not it is an infantry fighting vehicle at the end of the day the armor packaging could be i think a little bit more upgraded for the future i'm sure they do have capabilities for it to be upgraded in a more higher level if they needed it to be but remember this isn't going up against tanks for the most part and if it is then you know the black panthers are going to be following it beside uh, to give it some fire support i like the fact it also has active protection systems to give it a little bit of a you know repellent against most you know rocket pell grenades and you know sort of the low-tech uh firepower that could be coming towards this vehicle from north korea the power though and the speed of this thing is really impressive 70 k's an hour uh, in a vehicle of this kind at 25 tons is pretty impressive push along the firepower that comes with it with the beautiful 40 millimeter that's impressive. It's not an infantry fighting vehicle I don't think you'd like to mess with. Um, I would definitely put it on par with the CV-9040 and soon-to-be warrior infantry fighting vehicle. It'd be nice to see, uh, you know, one day if I could, you know, see one of these things in person, have a look around them, because I'm always fascinated by tanks, but infantry fighting vehicles is another level, because a tank's designed to kill another tank, but infantry fighting vehicles have another dynamic to them. They obviously have to carry infantry, but... The modern day is changing in the way in which we look at IFVs. It's not just an infantry fighting vehicle. As you can see in this configuration, they've been given, you know, heavier firepower to potentially knock out tanks. We're seeing heavier infantry fighting vehicle configurations being turned into scout vehicles. These big chunky vehicles that you think, that doesn't look very scout at all. And that's because scout vehicles are starting to become more of a sort of deterrent uh, to the main advancing battle group and that has to have some firepower behind it otherwise there's absolutely no point in you sending any kind of reconnaissance forward because if they can't defend themselves and report back that information well you're kind of pooched so i am kind of impressed by the k21 i would say it comes in a sort of a close third position for me uh i'd say fourth maybe i've got sort of the cv1940 at the front there i'd have the uh, the links or the Puma in second, Warrior in third, and then probably the K21 in fourth. Uh, maybe that's my Western bias, but I do think these vehicles are pretty darn impressive. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining me today on this video. I do really appreciate you stopping by. Um, due to the fact that we have a lot of craziness going on with the, you know, the coronavirus and things right now, I really do want you all to look out for yourselves. Please, you know, be good, good people. Um, protect your friends, protect your family, protect yourself. Uh, please be safe, be smart about it too, you know, look after your fellow human, don't go hoarding and buying and doing crazy stuff, uh, there's a lot of silliness going out there on social media right now, I don't want to try and, uh, you know, stay away from that stuff, and I know a lot of you guys are intelligent people following this channel, so please, you know, let's pass on that intelligence and that uh, common sense to those around us, and just work through this together and stick together as uh, one big military uh, liking uh, community, I guess, because you're only on this video primarily if you like military equipment, I'm sure. Um, if you did enjoy today's video, please leave me a like and a comment. I'd really appreciate it. If you want to be notified of any upcoming videos in the future, please hit the little bell by the subscribe button. For those of you who have been contributing towards my Patreon page, thank you so much for donating. I really, 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 really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Um, the next uh, funding that's going towards for uh, my Patreon is actually a new computer in general. Uh, the graphics board that I did purchase with my Patreon um, money is working very well, but unfortunately the computer is starting to fail uh, motherboard and I feel like um, I'm going to start losing this computer fairly soon because of the fact I've been pushing it so much with video editing and gaming and stuff. So we'll see how that goes, but uh, I hope I uh, get to see you all on the next videos, folks. And remember, please stay safe and look after yourself. All the best. Bye-bye.